The Resident Evil movies are dreadful. Let's just get that out of the way up front because I'm about to discuss some of the best examples of both the flagrant lack of respect for the source material and the general ineptitude of this god-awful franchise. For the uninitiated, Paul W.S. Anderson's Resident Evil movies are a series of inaccurate, inconsistent, multi-million dollar self-insert fanfics dedicated to his wife, who starred in the six films and gave less and less of a shit about actually acting as they went on. Starring possibly the definitive movie Mary Sue, Alice, the films only draw on the game's for material as a cheap ploy to trick fans into thinking the filmmakers give a single solitary shit about the source material. Character names and appearances stapled onto characters whose personalities are not Nothing like them, enemies thrown in with no consideration for their origins, and the occasional plot element twisted and mutated beyond recognition. The closest the films came to being an actual adaptation was the second film, Apocalypse, which is loosely based on Resi 3. The problem is, the films half arse even the scant details they do include as seen with this brief comparison between the game and film versions of Jill Valentine being saved in Raccoon City. <laughs> That's some good shooting. Who the fuck are you? Aside from being an uncharacteristic prick here, Jill was relegated to useless side character in an adaptation of her own fucking game! The first Resident Evil character to star in their own game and she's demoted and made utterly redundant by Alice at every turn. If Jill tries to do something, it fails and Alice has to fix it. If she does succeed, Alice has to one-up her because Paul wanted to make his fucking waifu look good. This continued into the fifth film where a slightly dazed Jill would defeat Super Saiyan Michelle Rodriguez by throwing a gun to Alice after the latter had had her fucking heart stopped. But it's not just Jill they butchered in these films, oh no. Let's take a look at the titular character of Resident Evil 3, Nemesis. In the game, Nemesis is the ultimate evolution of the tyrant first seen in Resi 1 as an incomplete, mindless killing machine. Resi 2 gave us Mr. X, a more intelligent, more durable version that could be programmed to hunt a specific target. The trilogy was capped off with an enhanced Mr. X, Nemesis, which is tasked with hunting down the surviving stars members, zeroing in on Jill after disposing of Brad. Nemesis hounds Jill, showing up at random to attack her over the course of the game, relentlessly haunting her, constantly repeating that one word Stars. as a representation of its single-minded obsession. It keeps coming no matter how much damage she deals to it, going through two mutations until it's a giant mass of flesh. Jill has to shoot it open with a railgun and empty a magnum into its brain to get it to stop, and even then we don't know for sure that it died from that before the nuke went off. In the movie, Nemesis is Matt from the previous film, transformed and directly controlled via a computer, which really takes away a lot of the intimidation. This humanises the creature, makes him a victim and more of a puppet than a deranged, obsessed stalker. Plus, he's never shown to be capable of running here, which doesn't help. Even the haunting Stars. is only used the one time when he specifically engages the unit itself. And as for how he dies, Alice beats him in hand to hand, gets through to Matt, and he shoots down a chopper that crashes into him and kills him. I mean, at least the novelization supposedly depicts him as surviving until the nuke drops to let him retain some dignity. As utterly fantastic as the costume was, they failed to translate what made Nemesis such an iconic, memorable creature that people still want to see in spin-off media. Ultimately though, nowhere was this flagrant lack of care and general ineptitude more clear than with the fourth movie, Resident Evil Afterlife. Releasing 18 months after Resident Evil 5, the movie takes a lot of elements from the game but doesn't consider any of the surrounding context. It includes enemies from the game which are Las Plagas infected Africans, not the series staple T-Virus infected Americans, but the movie doesn't explain that and leaves us to assume that this is an evolution of the T-Virus. Yes, the sequel did mention Plagas, but that was likely just in response to complaints from fans and came far too late. But the most infamous thing they stole, the word adapted isn't nearly earned by these films, is Chris Redfield and Sheva Alomar's fight with Albert Wesker. The movie switches out Sheva for Chris's younger sister Claire, but the choreography is almost beat for beat the same. And that just highlights how inept this entire enterprise truly was. Let's break it down. The fight opens with the two approaching Wesker from behind. The film also has Alice watching from the sidelines. Wesker says to the duo, You've really become quite an inconvenience for me. You've really become quite an inconvenience for me. 
In the game, this scene comes at the tail end of an 8 hour campaign taking place over multiple days where Chris and Sheva have been hounding Wesker and eliminating his followers. It's also the culmination of the decade long feud Wesker and Chris have had since RE1 where Wesker betrayed the Stars units and got most of them killed. They've had a few encounters since then which include a time Wesker threatened Chris's sister and one where Chris's partner Jill seemingly sacrificed her own life to save his. This fight leads into the final battle where Chris and Sheva put down Wesker for good. In the movie, there's nothing. Wesker has no connection to either Chris or Stars. Chris is just some asshole Alice finds in a prison cell in this movie. The only connection Wesker has to the Redfields is that Claire knows Alice from the previous film and that by helping Wesker's nemesis, she's technically also his enemy, even though she was just trying to lead her convoy to safety and didn't really care about Umbrella. And he's not talking about just the events of this film because he's been presumed dead since the opening scene and all they've done to oppose him is board a ship they didn't even know he owned. The line stood out in the game as an important acknowledgement of the conflict between protagonist and antagonist and highlighted Wesker's unflappable demeanour that we were about to shatter over the course of the upcoming sequence of boss fights. In the movie, they just took it because it's cool without considering how little it works without the surrounding context, highlighting this further by preceding it with the line, Well, isn't this one big family reunion? despite Wesker having met neither of the two before now. This is why this show was going to be called Context is King originally, because a recurring topic for the show will be how bad adaptations take elements from the source material, with no thought given as to how well it works in the new context of the adaptation. Another great example of this issue is this little exchange of blows here. Chris goes in low, shoulder barging Wesker's centre of mass, aiming to use his vast strength to push his foe back. Chris has bulked up significantly since RE1, figuring that, since he can't match Wesker's speed, he can at least be sure that if he does manage to get some hits in, they'll be damn good ones. We see numerous feats of strength from Chris both before and after this, so it's quite shocking when Wesker remains rooted to the ground and is barely moved, making a head motion as if to question if Chris really thought that would work, and beginning his counter-attack. In the film, however, Wentworth Miller is not nearly on Chris's level physically. If anything, he's closest to RE1 live action Chris, i.e. random white dude who happened to live in Japan at the time. Comparing movie Chris to game Chris is really like comparing, well, this. So not only does him attempting to shove Wesker make not nearly as much sense, but Wesker's no-selling of the attempt has zero impact. Robert Patrick would be a lot less imposing if he was throwing Michael Bean around instead of Arnold, after all. I don't blame Mr. Miller for any of this, of course. He did his best with what he was given, but what he was given didn't take into account what made this fight work in the game. The fight then proceeds pretty much unaltered until Wesker throws Chris and Claire into capsules so we can focus on Alice, acting as the culmination of the feud that started at the end of the previous movie, and and then continued through two more movies before having Wesker get killed by a door. And while we're here, let's also quickly discuss Jill's appearance in the film Stinger to set up the next film. In Resi 5, Jill is captured by Wesker after tackling him out the window in the flashback. She is then brainwashed and experimented on by Wesker. Jill is Wesker's secondary rival also since the first game. She also has a T-virus vaccine in her blood, is Chris's best friend, and just fell into Wesker's lap to give him this opportunity. Wesker has a lot to gain from brainwashing and experimenting on Jill. A skilled enforcer, a way to fuck with Chris, and access to a vaccine that could prove useful in crafting the Ouroboros virus. In the films, once again, there is no connection. She escaped from Raccoon City with Alice and helped her get out of an Umbrella building in the second film, but she has no connection to Wesker or Umbrella, was never infected with any virus, barely knows Alice, isn't known as particularly competent after having every single feat of hers claimed by Quan Chi, and has to be specifically sought out by Wesker to achieve this goal. At least putting the control device on Claire made a little bit of sense, but there is absolutely no reason for Wesker to seek out Jill here. And then the next film has her working against Wesker, because Paul can't write a consistent story to save his fucking life, so I guess he was the perfect choice to direct Mortal Kombat. He's not even a good director either. Despite most of it being lifted directly from the game, the film version of the fight is woeful by comparison. The CGI is atrocious, the bullet dodge effect looks terrible, and the choreography is unbearably slow, though that could just be because the film has more slow-mo than the entire Matrix trilogy combined. Capcom has this thing they do, a kind of video storyboard, where at least for Resident Evil and Devil May Cry, they'll film the scene in live action, usually with Japanese stuntmen, and use that as reference material for the cutscene staff. Resi 5 went 
went so far as to have the mocap performers dress in full costume, even dyeing Ruben Langdon's hair to match Chris's, and had them perform in front of a green screen with the game environment or a stand-in quickly thrown in behind them. Imagine, for a moment, that the actors performed the fight scenes at a slower pace than would be seen in the final product, as you do when you're learning the choreography, and that the footage would then be sped up for the final video. Now, imagine taking that unaltered footage, slapping in the background, and putting it in the final product. That's what this scene looks like in the film. The scene, ultimately, is a microcosm of the movie franchise as a whole. It's a bad adaptation whose only interest in the source material is for cheap, shallow fan service that can't even be enjoyed on its own merits because the writing and direction are totally inept. And this film had a budget of $60 million. Yes, my friends, this is $60 million at work. Are you excited for Monster Hunter? Fucking don't be. If they had just made Apocalypse with Alice in place of Jill, this could have worked. Alice has that connection to Matt, which is a decent enough justification for him hounding her the way Game Nemesis hounds Jill, but they just couldn't resist the temptation to have their fucking OC upstage the original core characters. 